Everyone who loves megaliths knows the tiny Mediterranean island of Malta is home to some of the most impressive Neolithic buildings in the world. Constructed between 3800 and 2500 BCE, these structures are hesitantly referred to by archaeologists as temples. This is because there's evidence for ritual activity having taken place in them, and they don't appear to have been domestic dwellings. That said, no one knows exactly what they were for, and it's unlikely that they were temples in the sense that we understand today. There are three things that make the Maltese megalithic buildings really stand out. Number one, they are unique in form and appearance, as are other aspects of the temple people's culture. Number two, the temple people were on the islands for several hundred years before they started building megalithic structures and creating art. However, as Professor Bonanno put it in a paper which I've referenced below, they did this without any hint of an embryonic origin and evolutionary process in previous phases. Number three, it appears that the number of Neolithic temples in existence was considerably more than might be expected from such small islands. Of course, these three points have led to lots of wild speculation, much of which doesn't stand up to further analysis. But that doesn't change the fact that there's a lot we don't understand about the temple people and their culture. In this video, I want to give an overview of all the megalithic sites that are known on the Maltese Islands. This includes those that were documented a long time ago and have disappeared since, as well as the UNESCO World Heritage Sites that can be visited by the public today. Why am I doing this? Because before we can speculate, we need to have all the facts. I will engage in a little mild speculation, not wild speculation though, at the end. So stay all the way through if you want to hear my fascinating personal insights. The Maltese archipelago is located in the central Mediterranean and covers just 316 square kilometers. That's 196 miles for my American audience. To illustrate this even further, the longest distance is from the southeast to the northeast of Malta, and this measures 27 kilometers, so 16 miles. It feels a lot longer when the traffic's really bad though. For simplicity, I've grouped the known and purported megalithic sites into three geographic areas, and I'll discuss the sources where I got my information from as I go along. The red pins are major sites, the yellow pins are known megaliths that may have belonged to temple structures, and the blue pins are documented but destroyed or lost sites. Starting with the southeast of the main island, there are some pretty major sites there. The most famous is the archaeological park that comprises the two extensive temple complexes of Hajaim and Amnidra. They are about 500 metres apart from one another, overlook the sea to the south of the island and have been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. There's also an accompanying museum. What a lot of people don't realise, and which is not mentioned in the museum, is that these are not the only megaliths in the area. The nearest village to Hajarim and Amnidra is called Rendi, which is famous for having a big sinkhole called Mahluba in the middle of it. This sinkhole was caused by a storm in medieval times that made the roof of a substantial cave collapse. It's not related to the megaliths, but it's a beautiful site which contains unusual flora, so I just thought I would mention it. In the west of this village are some megaliths in a field, which it's thought may have been part of another temple structure. These megaliths are one point five kilometers from Hajarim and Amnidra, so less than a mile, and sit on private property. I haven't been able to see them myself. The site is referred to as Sa'il Bal. Why is this relevant? Many of the extant sites are in geographical clusters, such as Hajarim and Amnidra and Tahajat and Skorba. Some researchers take these clusters as evidence that the Maltese temple should be considered as part of an integrated plan. However, since some sites haven't been excavated, some have been destroyed, and many are very limited in what remains, it's hard to make those sort of patterns and connections. Also, the dates of each site vary, sometimes by hundreds of years, and many temples were remodeled at different times in prehistory, with entrances being added and all sorts of modifications taking place. So it's unlikely that a Neolithic architect sat down and created a long-term construction plan that included all the sites. This is even more relevant when I discuss my own opinions on the temples at the end. 
So Hajarim and Amnidra have long been considered a pair, but they could just as well have been part of a larger site that included Sat, Ilbal, or other lost megalithic buildings in the area. Near the village of Sijuri, there is a hill with a chapel and a cross on top of it that can be seen from all over the south of the island. This is around three kilometers, so two miles west of Hajarim. The museum report covering 1911 and 1912 talks about a survey of a hill called Tal Alia, which I think, from what I've read, equates to this area. A text written in 1816 had talked about megaliths being found there, so in 1911 the antiquarians from the museum went to see if they were still extant. Unfortunately they didn't find anything, so it seems they were long gone. Interestingly, in the 19th century, antiquarians thought that the temples were Punic, not Neolithic, so most of these old texts refer to megaliths as belonging to Punic structures. But the descriptions make it clear that they are talking about the edifices that eventually were dated as Neolithic. About five kilometres, so three miles to the east of Hajarim, is a site called Talbakari. It doesn't look much, but it's really quite interesting. This is actually the remains of two Christian chapels, which it appears, based on the structures and pottery found in the area, were built on top of a Roman temple. There's also the remains of a Punic tower nearby. I found a reference in the archaeological literature to the idea that megaliths may have been reused for the construction of the Roman temple which opens up the intriguing possibility that a Neolithic structure once existed in this area as well. So you see the picture I'm building here. That's five possible megalithic sites all close to one another. Let's keep going because there are many more. Halarison is the name of a site with a couple of megaliths near the airport on the side of the road. No pottery sheds dating to the Neolithic were found near the megaliths, probably because the area around them is farmed. However, experts are quite certain they belong to a temple period structure. When the airport was built, a megalithic site called Iddebdiba was destroyed completely. Its excavation at the beginning of the 20th century had uncovered the remains of a rectilinear structure and pottery sheds from multiple time periods, including the Neolithic and the later Punic and Roman. Since megalithic buildings from the temple period were apsidal, it's possible that Iddebdiba was actually a classical period structure. However, a Neolithic scale model of a rectilinear building was found in the past and is now on display at the Archaeological Museum in Valletta. So rectilinear buildings may well have been a feature of the Neolithic as well. Also near the airport is a site called It Tambata. A water reservoir occupies the area where megaliths, including a typical trilithon entrance, were found in 1923. From what I've read, in spite of the reservoir, some remains still exist there. A site called Tachai was photographed in the 1950s and found to still exist when an archaeologist searched for it in 2000. It consists of a two metre long megalithic wall which had temple period pottery sheds in its vicinity. I believe it's on private property so I haven't been to it but it's also near the airport. So the airport sits on the site of what would have had another cluster of monuments during the Neolithic. In my mind one of the most fascinating groups of monuments is in the Paola Tarshin Santa Lucia areas of Malta. Here there are two Neolithic underground monuments, the very famous Hal Safliani Hypogeum and the small partially excavated Santa Lucia Hypogeum. This latter one used to have a megalithic above ground entrance but that's no longer there. There's also the Tarshin temples, a complex of highly decorated Neolithic buildings which are open to the public and there's the Cordin Three site. Cordin Three was pretty heavily damaged during World War II but what's left is preserved and can be visited by appointment. Why do I call it Cordin Three? Because there used to be five other temple period sites to the north of it. These were mentioned in the late 19th century but a survey in the early 20th century only found two of these which were labelled as Cordin One and Cordin Two. Unfortunately, these had also disappeared by the 1950s. Cordin 1 followed a rather random layout, so it didn't resemble other temple structures, although many temples do have irregular buildings connected to them, so they didn't always follow a perfectly symmetrical apsidal layout. However, on the excavation plan of Cordin 2, there are clear apses. So in this area, there was once seven above-ground megalithic complexes and two subterranean ones, 
maybe even more. To the east of this area, a site was mentioned in the early 20th century and later in the 1970s as being on the outskirts of Zabar and having a header and stretcher arrangement typical of a Neolithic temple. More recently, it was thought to have been lost because of the construction of an industrial estate. However, I did read an article a few years ago saying that the megaliths had been found during some further building works and they had been preserved. I can't find this article again though, for some reason. There was a fish scandal in the area a few years ago and it seems to be the only thing that comes up on Google related to that industrial complex. Finishing off this part of the island, there are four other known sites. Borj in Nadur is open to the public, but tickets have to be purchased at the Ardalam Museum nearby. I've mentioned Ardalam before, it's a cave with Paleolithic animal remains and accompanying exhibits. Not much is left of the Borj in Nadur temple, but there's a couple of fairly striking megaliths, and it's also the only temple to have had a megalithic wall surrounding its forecourt, so it's quite unusual in form. To the north is the multi-period site of Tas Silch, which can be visited by appointment only. Much of the later use of the site in the Bronze Age, Punic, Roman and Byzantine periods has obscured a lot of the Neolithic structures. However, it's thought that there may have been as much as five temples originally. Excavations are ongoing and more megaliths were found as recently as last year. Shrub Lajin Temple is one and a half kilometers, so just under a mile to the east of Tas Silj. It was excavated in 1914 and 1915, but a lot of it had already eroded away due to its coastal location on the edge of an undercut cliff. In 2015, a further megalithic structure was discovered at the site. The area, which is an inaccessible part of a nature park because of its dangerous location, is now under excavation again. It's hoped that whatever remains of the Neolithic structures can be recovered, moved and turned into a public exhibit. Half a kilometer to the west of Tas Silj is the site of Hao Jinwi. An excavation uncovered the remains of a temple, including megaliths, a torba floor and pottery shirts. The site was refilled, but some megaliths remain as part of a modern farm wall. The area is on private property, so I don't have any pictures of that one either. Let's move to the northwest of Malta. Main sites in this area are Tahajat and Skorba, which are open to the public. Skorba also has the remains of an early Neolithic village. If you remember from my previous videos, I explained that the earliest evidence of human habitation in Malta is from around 5800 BCE. But experts think there was a hiatus of almost a thousand years when the islands were abandoned before being resettled by the culture that eventually went on to build the temples. So the Skorba early Neolithic village is an important site for understanding the earliest period of human habitation on the island. Islands. Tal Adi Temple near Salina Bay is on private property but visible from a side road. There's not much left of this one. At some point it became part of a garden. It's where the artifact known as the Star Tablet was found and it appears to have been oriented to the northeast which is unusual since most of the temples where the layouts are known were oriented to the southeast. The temple is located in a rural area. There are lots of farms surrounding it, especially to the south. However, during the Neolithic period, this base stretched further inland, so the temple would have been on a small hill overlooking the sea. Bujiba Temple is in the garden of the Dolmen Hotel and can be visited by the public. You don't have to be staying there. I usually just ask reception and they let me go and have a look. Other megalithic remains in this part of the island include Kunchitzoni near the village of Bahria. When this was excavated in 1938, a few oval rooms and lots of pottery shirts were found. It's not accessible to the public though and I don't have any pictures of it. Ras Ir Raheb may or may not be Neolithic. There are megaliths, but no temple period pottery sheds were found nearby, only Punic. So they might belong to a later period. I personally think they look pretty Neolithic to me. Megaliths were also mentioned in the 1919 to 1920 museum report as standing on the peninsula called Ras il Pellegrin. I can't find much more information on these and can't quite figure out how to hike there, but I'll give it a go at some point. The Talipia site is a series of megaliths overlooking Janaina Bay. I read somewhere that coastal erosion is causing them to fall into a gap in the cliffs. I tried to find them, but I got lost, so I'll have to try again. I don't have any pictures of my own, but this screenshot is from the Facebook page called Temple Rescue. Taradina is a series of megaliths in the typical header and stretcher arrangement, which have been incorporated into a modern rubble wall at some time in their history. 
Temple period sherds were also found close by. They are right on the edge of the main road known as the Birkakara Bypass. A short distance to the northwest of this site in the village of Iklin, the remains of a temple were found in the 1960s. It hasn't been extensively excavated, but part of a statue and pottery sherds were found during an exploration of the site. In the centre of the island, the large town of Mostar wasn't known to have any temple remains until recently. There was talk in the late 1700s and early 1800s of a megalithic wall being found north of the Assel Valley. However, due to the construction of a fort, it was thought to have been lost. A survey in the area carried out a few years ago before a large construction project began did reveal a number of megaliths incorporated into modern rubble walls on farmland. These are quite a distance from the fort, so it's possible there were several temples in this area as well. I noticed these megaliths when I was out megalith hunting one day and I thought I was the first to find them, but I wasn't. Behind the coastal village of Shemshia, high up on the hill, there is a heritage trail which includes remains from different time periods. There are Roman aperies, a 1000 year old carob tree, a Punic tomb, temple period tombs and a cart rut. However, there's also the remains of a temple along with some scattered megaliths. It's never been excavated and kind of looks like a pile of rubble. But if you explore the forested area around it, there are more megaliths hiding in the vegetation. And it's very clear it's yet another Neolithic structure. There are some references to it in the archeological literature. So it'd be nice if one day the area gets excavated. Overlooking the bay near the Selman Palace, other megaliths were reported in a Nature 2000 management plan. They are incorporated into modern rubble walls. I haven't managed to find these ones yet either. They're probably on private property so not accessible. I always check if I can see anything from the road though because sometimes you can. In the museum report of 1919 to 1920 a stone circle called Ta Zamitello was mentioned as being close to the village Umjar as were megaliths on the southern slopes of Janaina Bay. As far as I know neither of these sites were surveyed and are no longer extant. In the same report, two stone circles were referred to in Marfa and St Paul's Bay. These also don't appear to have been excavated and didn't survive. What's interesting is that stone circles aren't typical of Neolithic Malta. The only ones still partially extant mark the entrance to the hypogeum known as the Shara Stone Circle in Gozo, and obviously gave it its name. I wonder if these previously reported stone circles were actually Neolithic stone circles, and if they were, could they have marked the entrance to other hypogea? And if they did, that means the hypogea is still there, but no one knows where. Also on this side of the island, the museum report of 1935 to 1936 detailed the excavation of a megalithic site near Baha Itcha. As far as I know, none of it remains, but I'm not really sure. The excavation revealed a megalithic wall, a torba floor, two circular enclosures, an entrance flanked by two orthostats, and a semicircular apse. A megalithic structure referred to as a covered way was also found nearby in Maktab. The passageway was 10 metres long, but is no longer there. So now let's go to the smaller neighbouring island of Gozo. The most famous Neolithic remains on Gozo are, of course, the Gigantia temples, which are a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Located in the village of Shara, they are once again part of a cluster. To the west of Gigantia, Neolithic pottery sherds were found in a cave called Arta Ezu, and there are scattered megaliths surrounding this cave, so it was probably the site of a Neolithic structure as well. A short distance to the west is the hypogeum known as the Shara Stone Circle. Originally, this was made up of a necropolis and an above-ground stone circle with a trilithon entrance. Further to the west is the Santa Verona Temple. Not much of it remains, but excavations have revealed its original layout, which was similar to the Gigantia temples. Two fields near the village of Einselem also contain megaliths, but the sites have never been excavated and are on private property. Borj Larib can be viewed from the road and looks like the remains of two temple walls. Limray's Beat can also be seen from the road and looks like the remains of a stone circle rather than a typical temple structure. In the early 20th century, the antiquarian priest, Father Magri, partially excavated what he thought were the remains of a temple in the village of Shukia. Unfortunately, none of it survived. A few megaliths, many pottery sherds and a torba floor were found at the site. On the southern outskirts of the capital Victoria, on the way down to Munshar, 
There are megaliths covered in vegetation in a field which are the remains of a temple. This has been named Tamarzina. I haven't managed to find these megaliths yet myself. All the descriptions of it in books talk about following a path opposite the windmill. However, there's now a building there, so the path is more of a tunnel, which looks like private property. I just don't know. Interestingly, it's close to the Neolithic domestic village of Tachola that's undergone a series of excavations over the years. Very few domestic sites dating to the Neolithic have been found in Malta, so it's quite possible that each temple complex acted as a meeting place for a nearby village. Because the domestic buildings were made of mud brick with limited stone foundations, they obviously didn't survive as well as megalithic structures. On the Tachench cliffs near the village of Sanat, there are dolmens and cart ruts, which are thought to date to the Bronze Age, as well as some megaliths that appear to have been part of a Neolithic temple. The site called Borj Limrama has never been excavated and there's no clear apsidal outline typical of temple remains. However, it's likely that a large megalithic structure once stood there. The megaliths are all mixed in with modern rubber walls and they aren't that easy to find. So that's pretty much all of the sites I've read about. There are a few others that I just can't find any decent information on. I also didn't include dolmens and menhirs because they are likely to be Bronze Age, so much later than the temples. But you get the general idea here. I've listed more than 50 sites. They were built over the course of more than a thousand years and for the vast majority of them, no one knows what their layout or orientation was. So it's quite hard to consider them all as part of one big planned project. So what were they for? Let's return to the original mysteries about them that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. Why was the Temple People's culture so unique compared to other contemporary groups in the Mediterranean? And how did their structure and art appear so fully formed? The Temple people are thought to have come from Sicily, which didn't have a megalithic culture at that time. In fact, it never developed one. So that makes the situation even more perplexing. I personally think that many of the lost sites were not part of sophisticated structures. In those sites, we might find the embryonic phases that show an evolution in skill and style. There are so many sites that have been lost or destroyed. Only the relatively sophisticated ones in non-urban areas survived, probably because they were so big and rurally located. So what I've come to think, and keep in mind this is just speculation, is that they evolved their style over a long period of time. Many buildings would have fallen out of use as they embarked on bigger and better projects. In terms of the uniqueness of the temple people's culture, it could simply have been an autochthonous creation. There's no reason why not. In spite of the temple people importing obsidian from Pantelleria and Lipari, they would still have been relatively isolated, and in that isolation could well have developed their own extraordinary art and architecture. Of course, there are features of the megalithic structures and carvings that are similar to other megalithic cultures in Europe, but overall there are no clear parallels. The third mystery, why are there so many sites? The resources available on the islands at the time would not have been able to sustain a massive population. Okay, it's possible there was some trade, but I don't think any vessels have been found from other regions, so there couldn't have been that much. Trade was something that characterized the Bronze Age far more than the Neolithic. So if the population wasn't huge, why did it need so many places for ritual or worship? I did wonder if maybe Malta had been a sort of pilgrimage site for other central Mediterranean cultures, but I think there would be more evidence for that. I think that the Neolithic people didn't separate the sacred and the profane as clearly as we do today. The megalithic structures probably played a functional as well as a spiritual role. I read a paper by archaeologists that suggested the temples may have been important meeting places for the community. But perhaps many activities were carried out there. Community meetings, healing practices, celebratory feasts, funerary ceremonies before the body was carried elsewhere for burial, as well as seasonal and situational rituals. If that were the case, then the vast number of them doesn't seem so strange. Each temple would have been a focal point for the nearest village. So that's my take on it. I might change my mind, but that's what I think at the moment. I know it still doesn't explain a number of other issues, such as how did they build them? But we can get to that another time. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. A lot of people have asked me what I think about the Malta episode of Ancient Apocalypse, especially the Sirius alignments. Last year I read the book Sirius the Star of the Maltese Temples by Lenny Redick and if you want I'll do a video discussing my thoughts on it. Also let me know in the comments if that's something you want me to do.
Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching and for supporting me through channel membership, Patreon, Super Chats and everything else. I really appreciate it and I'll see you next time.